I've just been in love with music, man, since I was a kid. You know, uh, five years old, I'm begging my mom and my grandma to let me take piano lessons. You know, in poverty, you know, you, you have a desire to not be broke. I wasn't making selling drugs a lifestyle anyway. I wasn't looking to grow it and be this kingpin type of a guy. So, you know, it was, it was a matter of just survival for me. Either I win or lose, you know, and, and it began, I began to ask myself questions like, you know, why am I even dealing with this? I've tried to reach my hand out to help an independent artist. And they've heard all the horror stories, so they're like, no, I want to stay independent, I want to stay independent. And you're like this, and you just got to sit there and watch them drown in slow motion because you don't have this, the, the resources. At that moment, at that very moment, man, this steel come over me, like this presence, and it was very peaceful, and it, was, it felt, made me feel like everything was going to be okay. I'm Tico Hudson, and this is my journey. I know there's been a lot of speculation about my retirement and what I plan on doing next. And you know, throughout my life, I faced many obstacles. The road has not always been clear. But during those tough times, I felt alone. But I prayed and I asked God for strength. In my turmoil, God reached out to me and it revealed whatever I was going through was a part of my true destiny. It was at that moment I made a decision to stop getting in the way of God's plans because my true story of my destination was my journey. Tico Hudson is a Grammy-nominated music producer who owns his own production company out of Atlanta, Georgia. He brings an exciting and fresh sound to the music industry, using the talents he developed at a young age, when the obstacles of life seemed impossible to bear. But no matter how hard they may have seemed, Tico would later learn that through faith, he would have the victory. What makes my story unique is the fact that I'm still here. You know, in spite of, you know, a lot of the, the, the blows I had taken, um, I'm still here, you know, uh, doing my music and, you know, doing it for a living. You know, and there were a lot of things that really tried to stop me from doing that. You know, I was, you know, the whole thing was escaping poverty, you know, escaping that lifestyle that, you know, that, of, that struggle, you know, was the whole motivation to begin with, you know. Um, and I guess that came from, you know, just being born, you know, you know, in poverty, you know, you, you have a desire, it, it kind of, you have an inbuilt desire to not be broke. You know what I'm saying? So I was just, you know, everything from going to get my, de my degree to selling drugs to going to California, all that was motivated by wanting, wanting out. I was with uh, a group, uh, we were Grammy nominated, you know, the group disbanded. And, you know, after that, there was some reverberation that had our fan base really just kind of turned off to the music. So, you know, there was a point in time where it felt like, you know, the music that I created didn't have an audience anymore. So, you know, just the fact that, you know, my audience is growing now, you know, and, uh, you know, it just shows me that God is, God is a, he's an awesome God, man, and very faithful. I was born and raised in Albany, Georgia, single mom, you know, me and my brother, um, you know, at, at points in time we had been on, you know, um, public, you know, uh, public, uh, what do you call it, uh, assistance. And, uh, but then, you know, as we grew older, she, you know, took on two, sometimes three jobs at a time. You know, it, it left the door open to me and my younger brother to just go out and explore, you know, the, the, the neighborhood, you know, and in the neighborhood, everything is not all good. So, you know, you find yourself getting, you know, into different things. Uh, but, you know, I was a good student, you know, and I had a, a few teachers that would, you know, really encourage me along the way. And, uh, you know, I kind of, latched on, on to, 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 to the encouragement, you know, uh, to see me through a lot of those years. Tico also developed a level of street knowledge that was influenced by his closest peers and the culture surrounding him. You know, a lot of uh, decision making um, when it came to, you know, lifestyle, um, when it came to, you know, uh, you know, pretty much the culture that was developing when we were young. You know, we now call it the hip hop culture, but it was a culture that, you know, that really accentuated certain things. Well, at least it gets kind of deep because, you know, it didn't start, you know, we know the history of hip hop. It didn't start out that way. But as it progressed to the more, you know, the gangster, you know, lasciviousness, you know, the lewdness kind of took, you know, made, had an influence. I should say on my, my brother and I and, you know, selling drugs and, you know, womanizing, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
You know, I had a couple of homeboys that were already doing it. You know, they were from, you know, other parts of the city and, you know, different, you know, I was from like William Benz neighborhood. They were from, you know, Mount Zion projects, you know, William Benz was a project and, you know, we kind of connected at school and, uh, you know, everybody's hungry. You know, so it's like we kind of, you know, uh, you know, came together on that tip, you know, uh, we're poor guys, you know, and here's an opportunity, basically. But unlike many of his peers, Tico did notice a difference between him and the others. You know, I had one foot in the street and one foot in the classroom, so to speak. So I was a little different than, than most do. You know, I kind of see myself as that. I'm, I'm a little different, you know, because uh, I was in the orchestra, for example, you know, playing the stream bass. And, you know, I played the piano and things of that nature. So, you know, you know, I would get picked at. But, uh, you know, I was the kind of guy like, OK, you see a punk, you know, slap him, you know, kind of thing. You know? You know, so it was a, uh, it's was, it was a very uh, uh, ambiguous time period in my life where, you know, I'm, I'm out doing the street stuff, but then I'm also, you know, uh, in the in the four level, um, which is like next to uh, the uh, advanced placement, you know, taking those classes and things of that nature. So it was kind of different. I've just been in love with music, man, since I was a kid, you know. Uh, five years old, I'm begging my mom and my grandma to, you know, um, let me take piano lessons, you know, because I wanted to play that bad, you know, just listening to music on the radio and just wanting to know, you know, what's behind the sound, you know, and, and learning that, you know, keys and things of that nature. Tico found a way to use his education as a way to get him away from the environment that threatened his life on a daily basis. After I graduated, I moved out to California. You know, back at home, again, I'm in the streets, so, you know, it's a lot of shootouts. And, you know, I wasn't a part of a gang, but, you know, I was more defensive during this whole little time period of my life. So, you know, I was always in little shootouts and fights and stuff like that, just trying to go out and have fun. I couldn't because that was his rival gang, you know, always there. So, you know, having to be able, being able to separate myself from that scene altogether, you know, but not be too far from mom and the family and things like that worked out real good. I turned down an internship uh, with the uh, uh, Atlanta Journal Constitution um, because I had one that summer, my, the summer of my uh, 11th, my, 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 my junior year, I think, going into my senior year, and it was a horrible experience. You know, I just couldn't find myself, you know, putting on the, you know, the shirt and tie and, you know, every morning and being in this corporate environment, man, this very cold room with all these cubicles and stuff. It was just terrible experience for me so I, you know I wanted to pursue my career in music so I felt like you know if I just get to a point where somebody can hear me you know I'm pretty sure I'll be fine and uh, you know went out there I ran into an a independent label and that label um, was ran by some uh, Crips and uh, they had some internal issues resultantly so that kind of dissipated you know but that was like my only shot out there um, so when things were not going as he had hoped, Tico found himself back into some old habits in order to survive. Well, I just, uh, I was trying to find my next opportunity, you know, but uh, in the interim, I had to do things like wash cars and things like that. Um, that didn't work out for too long, and then I ended up uh, selling drugs out there, you know, just to kind of, you know, keep a hotel, you know, keep a hotel room. And uh, that led to some crazy stuff. And, um, you know, I couldn't find a regular job. I was getting like KFC. I remember KFC telling me I was overqualified. Um, you know, a couple of other, you know, uh, jobs I went out there. I just, you know, had no luck. I, w I looked for the job before I started selling drugs in California. I wasn't making selling drugs a lifestyle anyway. You know, I was kind of, I was a guy that, you know, you may catch me with a bong, you know, uh, you know, a couple of months out, of, you know, out of a, out of a quarter, you know, but I'm not the guy that's just gonna, you know, just, I wasn't looking to grow it and be this kingpin type of guy. So, you know, um, it, was, it was a matter of just survival for me, you know. So, you know, when I went out to California, I went, you know, thinking that I would be able to find some job to kind of tie me over until, you know, I'm discovered and all this kind of stuff, so. But selling drugs as an option did not last as Tico faced an unfortunate situation. When this mom, uh, approached me and the guys I was with, you know, and what what we now call the trap, we just called it, you know, the, the spot or whatever, you know, back then. 
Um, and um, she didn't have any money. And um, when she first approached, you know, she was just like, you know, whatever, you know, can, can I do whatever? And, uh, you know, the guys I was with, there's some comical guys, you know, they clowning them. You know, no, you can't do that for us, blah, 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 woo, woo, woo. So, you know, she kind of crying and stuff until she could tell she's really feeling bad. She came back with a bike and a kid. She said, can I give you this bike? You know, she offered a bicycle for in exchange for drugs. Uh, one of the other guys said, yeah, you know, took the bike, the little kid crying, you know, and, uh, you know, as they left, it was, just, it, it was just like a real spiritual moment for me. I felt like, you know, I was, you know, just in a wrong environment. You know, I just didn't like the spirit that, you know, that, that, uh, that situation uh, showed me, you know, that, you know, this woman was being controlled enough to the point where she didn't even care about her son's feelings and that she would sell her son's bike, you know, for a high. And, you know, I'm, I'm a son, you know, so I guess I kind of related to the kid in that moment. And uh, just, you know, I was like, nah, this is, you know, not what I want to do. I don't want to be no, you know, I want to be a part of this. With the rest of the dope I had, I threw it on the, on the ground and crushed it under my feet, and I was done. If I could recall correctly, I think I was like, you know, just, a, you know, just wondering, like, you know, just kind of, you know, in, in limbo. I didn't know what was next. You know, I didn't know where to turn. I was out of answers. You know, I just, uh, I just knew that that wasn't the answer. So I was like, you know, and that whole while I had an uncle out there. Um, he's now deceased, but he was uh, involved in church and, you know, he would stay in my ear, you know, because from time to time I was able to call on him for, you know, grocery money and things like that, you know. I was out there struggling, you know, really trying to, you know, stay afloat. And, uh, you know, whenever he would come by with some groceries or anything, he would come, you know, with a, a testimony or a word, you know, and uh, it was resonating with me to the point where it made me want to know more. The next move was really, you know, getting involved in learning, you know, more about the Word of God because I was seeking answers by that time. Like, you know, things weren't, weren't really working out the way I wanted them to. You know, so, you know, I just began to really seek answers. Tico found himself homeless, doing just what he could to get by. So part of that time, I, um, I, I had a, a little side gig moving pianos, you know, uh, working for a piano, an independent uh, piano mover, I guess you would call them. And um, outside of that, you know, I ended up homeless. It, that, at that particular point in time, it wasn't a very long ordeal with homelessness. It was like three or four days, you know. Uh, I stayed in this um, Greyhound station for about three days, you know. And, um, you know, eventually was able to pay for another hotel room. The only thing I can recall from that moment was, um, you know, realizing that my well-being was entirely up to me. Like at the end of the day, I had nobody to call. I had exhausted my phone call list. You know, and uh, everybody was like, you know, I ain't got it, I ain't got it. You know, you know, no one could help at that point in time. So um, just realizing that, you know, okay, you know, something has to change. Something has to give, you know, either, either, either I win or lose, you know. And, and it began, I began to ask myself questions like, you know, why am I even dealing with this? You know, first of all, I wasn't able to use my college degree because there was a, a woman at the institution. Still to this day, I couldn't pick her out of a crowd. But she saw fit to hold my degree from me out of uh, the Perkins Loan Department, you know. And this was a loan that, you know, of course, I'm still a student at the time, so, you know, my loan shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been uh, due, you know, because you have a grace period when you're in school but they lost my address or they lost my whereabouts and they were sending um, uh, mail to the wrong address. She, once she realized this, she still had no uh, will to, you know, make it right, you know. I eventually paid that loan off and she still held my degree. I had my professors calling on my behalf. This woman still held my degree. Since then, she's been fired for embezzlement, you know. But I went for years without my, my degree and. You know, that was, that's what led to a lot of that situation in California. I didn't have, you know, my degree. I could have at least gotten a job teaching or something, you know. 
While facing his battles, Tico would occasionally receive a word of wisdom from his uncle. One of the things I can remember him saying that really resonated with me was, uh, you know, Tico, God is a burden removing, yoke destroying God. And as intelligent as I thought I was, I, you know, yoke, the only uh, word, uh, thing that I can associate yoke with at that time was an egg. So I'm like, yoke destroying, yoke destroying, what, what does that mean? And I asked him, you know, what does that mean? And, uh, and I said, you know, and I said the same thing I just said to you, you know, all I could think about is eggs when you talk about yoke. And so he said, have you ever seen an illustration of like a uh, cattle from back in the day when they had these big wooden clamps around their neck? I was like, yeah. And uh, he's like, that's a yoke. And when he said that, it just, you know, it, it just immediately resonated with me. Like, okay, that's exactly how I feel. Like I got something weighing me down, like, you know, like a beast of burden, you know, they trying to plow ahead, but it's something kind of holding them back. You know, so I was like, yeah, that's what I need. I need God to destroy this yoke, you know. And so that was really what gave me that desire to seek, seek him and that power that he was telling me about. And so I said this prayer. I was taught this prayer uh, in this church that my uncle would take me to out there. Um, and it was a prayer of faith. Um, I, was, I was taught to pray. Um, first of all, you go into God's courts with thanksgiving you know, hallelujah, and you know, give him all the praise that he deserves, he truly deserves. You look at this great, vast world, and there's no denying his, his, his power and his presence. So you're praying, thanking him in advance for just hearing you, you know, for, for, for being faithful enough to hear you as he said he would if you come to him in thanksgiving and in praise. So I did that, and then um, I was always taught to, you know, um, make your petition, no, you know, after that point. So you don't go, come in complaining like, God, I got all these problems. You know, you come in thanking him for, for, for taking the moment to hear your prayer. And so then I, I let my petition be known. You know, I got these, you know, this joke. You know, I'm, I'm facing homelessness. You know, I can't get ahead. I got this situation with my school. Can't get my degree. You know, nobody wants to give me a job, it seems, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm at the point now that, you know, I'm, I'm ready to give up. So if I can't hear from you, I'm done. You know, this life you gave me that's supposed to be a gift doesn't feel like a gift, I'm done, you know. And so, uh, you know, I, I said that, that prayer and I said, but I know that, you know, you are yoke destroying burden removing God. So I, I, I believe that I receive the power of your, your, your yoke destroying burden removing power in Christ's name. And I sealed it like that and amen. And uh, at that moment, at that very moment, man, this. I know it sounds cliche, but it's real. You know, I felt this steel come over me, like this presence, and it was very peaceful, and it was it felt made me feel like everything was gonna be okay. I got in filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, I think that was a major part. You know, learning about the Holy Spirit and how He operates, and um, you know, the rest has just been an ongoing journey, man, of walking with Him. As Tico continued to walk by faith, he held on to his beliefs as he pushed through his battles. It's still been tough, you know. Yeah, it's still, it's not, it's not, you know, walking in a bed of roses all of a sudden. Nah, you know, you're still going to have your challenges. I definitely had my share of them, you know, um, ups and downs, um, you know, but he's just always there, you know. And, and it seems that the strong, the, 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 the closer I get to him, you know, the, the, the better I am at navigating through a lot of those trials and tribulations, you know what I'm saying? I have full confidence in the power of God, and, and I've, I've seen so many situations where I just, I, I wanted to do something out of the flesh to handle the situation, but I gave it to him, and I've seen him work through each and every last one of those in crazy ways. As things began to make a turn for the better, Tico first had to learn a hard lesson on the meaning of show business. One of those ordeals was uh, the deal that I had with Sony that I lost, and it was because of the business partner that I chose to be with me, uh, this, you know, um, I chose this guy, he was uh, out of California, and, um, you know, um, I was responsible for, of course, uh, producing the record, recording the record, writing the record, you know, uh, all of that. And uh, he was responsible for the marketing promotions and, you know, basically the financing of uh, the release. And, um, you know, Sony, of course, is they're, they're, they're the distributor uh, which was a deal that actually came through, uh, to me through uh, some, some good friends of mine who are like uh, fans of some of my older music with my uh, old group. 
Ziglag. And um, um, so I secured the, the distribution deal, but didn't have the finances. So I brought this guy on. This guy, long story short, um, didn't have any respect or regard for, you know, the situation and wanted to, you know, have me to sign off a 100% copyright ownership to him in order for him to make good on his side of the deal. Mind you now, this guy was, you know, Brother Tico, can I pray for you? Father God, in the name of Jesus. And, you know, just, you know, one of those guys that was really, you, you would really think he was, you know, um, a stand-up brother in Christ. And, uh, you know, for, for most of that time, I felt like this was a big brother that God had planted in my life. But uh, he really showed his colors, man. Um, you know, when we were finishing the album in California, um, and my son was graduating at the time, I think, needed, and I needed, you know, money for cap and gown or something like that. And um, I was depending on the money that he had owed me, according to the deal that we had. And he said he was gonna hold off until we finished the album. I went out there, finished the album with great difficulties. He cited those difficulties as a reason why I'm gonna show you this money, but I'm not gonna give it to you. You know, sent me home empty handed. Um, and then came the offer for 100% ownership of my music or bus. He's not going to fulfill the, his part of the deal at all, which of course would put me in a bad light with Sony. And that's exactly what happened because I wasn't going to take, you know, that kind of a deal at all. Well, I realized that everybody who says that they're with God or they're for God, they're not for. So, you know, don't fall for the smoke screen, you know, and, um, you know, and, you know, so it, it had me thinking where, you know, I, I couldn't go in, you know, blind, you know, you know, the Bible says be wise as a serpent. So now that I, when I go into my business endeavors, you know, I'm, I'm making sure that business is handled the right way. You know, paperwork is done, you know, every, all terms are agreeable before we move forward. Um, that's the main thing I, I, I walked away from that, and, um, you know, um, a lot of those ordeals really, you know, taught me uh, about the spirit of liberty too, you know, because I had kind of boxed myself into this religious mindset for a little while because I thought that's where God was, but, you know, everything was showing me that that's not God at all, you know, so the spirit of liberty allows a person to really operate alongside him, you know, and not, you know, what looks right to, you know, everybody else, you know, so it, it kind of gets you beyond the point of being, you know, judged and, you know, and, uh, and, and confound to, you know, what people's ideas of you are and what you should be. But Tico did not let one bad experience keep him down. Instead, he did what was necessary to find a way to get back to his true passion. So I just... Ended up getting my degree, getting to teaching, um, and then, you know, I'm a musician, man. I, you know, I love music. You know, I've been loving music since I was a kid, and I felt like I was dying on the inside because, you know, I wasn't able to, you know, create music. So I walked away from a job, came back to Atlanta, and uh, since then, you know, it's, uh, it's been, it's been uh, very interesting. What has allowed me, you know, even at this late stage of my, my life, later stage, I ain't gonna say late, but later stage of my life, you know, allowed me to come back. It's because a lot of, you know, producers are, you know, uh, these days, they're not very musically inclined, you know, with the technology, they don't, they don't have to be, you know, but uh, there's still a need for, let's say you have a song, you know, um, and it has a certain melody, certain lyrics, you know, you can't go to one of these guys who just kind of cut and paste their beats and they sound great, but they can't follow your melody because they, can't follow your melody. So, you know, there's a need for, you know, producers such as myself who, who play and that can turn, you know, ideas into tangible, you know, audible products, you know. With that knowledge, Tico started his own company and created a place for himself in the music industry. My company is Tico Hudson Productions. Um, I produce for a few people such as, uh, you know, uh, EJ the Witch Doctor from the Dungeon family. I'm uh, currently Getting ready to go into the studio with Soleil, which is one of my, you know, favorite female MCs of all time. So I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, I've worked with um, Curtis Blow and, um, you know, quite a few artists here and there. Um, 
you know, so I'm, I'm getting a lot of, uh, Digital Lives Matter was a, a movie that just came out on BET that I got uh, some placement in, you know, with uh, one of my tracks in uh, Ricardo Flo, uh, which is uh, Black's dad. I don't know if y'all familiar with Black, um, but the uh, artist that just came out like last year, uh, just working with his dad and, um, you know, a lot of things moving, man. And from his lessons in life, Tico also takes the time to do what he can to help others in the industry. Independent artists, producers, um, what you want to do is make sure that you, um, you want to make sure that you can afford to be independent. You know, I see that, uh, that mistake a lot, a whole lot, to the point where I've, I've tried to reach my hand out to help an independent artist. And, you know, and they've heard all the horror stories, so they're like, no, I want to stay independent, I want to stay independent. And you're like this, and you just got to sit there and watch them drown in slow motion because you don't have the, the, the resources to really drive your project. You know, um, they're, they're, you're going to need some resources, some finances. You know, so, so many artists are making that mistake. So I say this, if you're not able to afford to be an independent, then, you know, that needs to be your goal. But don't, don't refuse help along the way. You know, if these are, if I'm coming to you with agreeable terms and you see that this is not going to hurt you or, or me, it's just to protect both parties coming to the table. You know, don't, don't just, you know, uh, textbook deny that opportunity to yourself. I guess it's, you know, with the experience, you know, over years, it's second nature now. Um, it's, it's, um, it's just when you know God um, and, you know, God is never going to go against his word. So you, you're always going to have the word of truth to balance, you know, the voice that you're hearing. You know, um, so you, you have to be a student of the word, you know, in order to make sure that the voice you're hearing, because there's more than one spirit in existence and in operation. You know, and truth be told, we all hear different voices, you know, uh, from different spirits. You know, so, um, you know, you have to be able to determine, you know, which one is of God and uh, the word is fail proof. A lot of it is I do internally now. You know, I've learned that that's, uh, that's something that's very powerful because you're awakening the God that's in you, you know, and, and, and there's, an, you know, your inner being is to be fed instead of, I think what we've gotten into a lot is, you know, uh, this outwardly Christianity, you know, and it's out, outward, you know, but there's no development on the inside. So, you know, I've learned to pray, you know, internally uh, and with my inner voice, if you will. So, uh, you know, just developing that relationship with them over years, man, <laughs> you know, and seeing the results, that's, this kind of really seals the deal, you know, knowing that, okay, this, this is the one I can rely on, you know. On the next, The Journey with Lamar Woodley. We all will have bad things that happen to us in life. Nobody is in a perfect situation. It's so many things in life that I know. And so I can speak into the hearts of people that's broken and I can tell them, you can live through it.